Um, so we're going to move on to Professor Toro, who is going to talk about something that is far beyond my <laughs> ability to understand, but I'm going to listen. <laughs> um, so I'm going to let you just take it away. Professor okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to extend uh, our work. So it is a, a topic which is probably a little bit different, perhaps very different to the main focus of this of this meeting. But nevertheless, I hope that there are some connections to the to your to your interest. So uh, the motivation for, for this work is the is anatomical muscle matrix and what happens to the body fluid dynamics. Actually, that could have been the title of my presentation. So in particular, we're interested in intracranial uh, venous structures, uh, extracranial venous structures, anomalies in the CSF system, and this may touch upon the interest of most of you in, in this meeting. But the work I'm going to present is essentially related to the first two topics. Um, there are lots of publications that associate neuropathology to malformations and the effect in the fluid dynamics of the uh, related to fluid systems. In particular, Simon disease, Parkinson, and, and the list is, is rather long. Uh, now, neurological diseases, we all know, are prominent, uh, as we can see in this graph here. Uh, uh, but uh, obviously, there is the issue of the causes being unknown. Uh, there is no cue. We, we don't know the causes, obviously. Treatments uh, aim for amelioration, mitigation. But one of the things that uh, uh, seems to be uh, uh, accepted is that the involvement of the dynamics of fluids or the central nervous system is important. And then the topic becomes uh, uh, very much an interdisciplinary research topic uh, involving not only medical doctors from the clinical point of view, but also other scientists. And this might explain why mathematicians can also <clears throat> get involved. So if we look at uh, the central nervous system, uh, fluid, major fluid, extracellular fluid, fluid systems, uh, we have ob obviously the arterial system uh, uh, very much studied. Uh, we have the venous system not very much studied. And then we have the microvasculature in between. We have obviously interstitial fluids. And we have the cerebrospinal fluid here being prominent uh, when looking at uh, neurological diseases. And we have also the, the obviously the lymphatic system. Uh, now, the idea of our work here is to try to connect the fluid systems and understand their interacting dynamics, rather than looking at one particular fluid system uh, in isolation. Uh, now, this can be done uh, by mathematical modeling with all the simplifications that are actually necessary, obviously. And so what I'm going to address mainly in the presentation is what happens to the venous system. Uh, as I said earlier, very much uh, uh, taking second place in, in, in the interest of researchers. Uh, but there has been a, a resurgence of the venous system in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and here I'm going to summarize some of the main features of this system here. A particular system, a particular feature of the venous system here is the very high nonlinearity of the system in the sense that the cross sectional area of venous vessels is highly deformable. It depends very much on, uh, on pressure here. Uh, and so you can see that uh, we can have high pressure and the cross sectional area looks very much like. Uh, uh, the concessional area of uh, an artery, but as the pressure decreases, this is transmuter pressure, so it can be negative, 
uh, the, the, the shape of these places change, changes quite dramatically, uh, including collapse uh, under physiological conditions. Now, uh, just to remind you that uh, the functions of the venous system consist in returning oxygen depleting blood to the heart, a major role in clearance of metabolic waste, and this is receiving a lot, a lot of attention in the last probably 10 years or so, the, 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 the clearance function of uh, the central nervous system, fluid systems. It, it collects three main types of fluids, uh, interstitial fluids, CSF, and lymph. So the venous system acts as a sink to major fluid systems. So the performance of the venous system is going to be important to other fluid systems, of course. Not only that, it holds 70% of the blood in the body. So by the sheer control of a large amount of volume of blood, it, it plays a, also an important role in the dynamics of fluids. Yeah. It, it, and naturally, it plays a, a major fluid, in, fluid, uh, role in this uh, CNS uh, dynamics, uh, brain dynamics, fluid dynamics. Recently, um, there is a, a role assigned as well to the venous system in the so-called glymphatic uh, system. Uh, now, venous uh, malformations in head and neck are well documented. This is the case, uh, uh, what I'm showing, showing here is a patient on the left-hand side here. So we are only looking at the major veins of the head and neck. And on the right hand side, we see a, a healthy control where you see all major vessels clearly defined in the case of the healthy control and a, a, and a, a, a quite a chaotic a, a display of vessels in the case of the, of the patient. Uh, now, the literature associates uh, um, anomalies of this kind to a number of more specific conditions. Uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, for example, multiple sclerosis uh, proposed by uh, Henke, Zamboni, and others. In, in ophthalmology, in, this, this uh, is an important issue. In many years, the disease, more, more, more recently, actually, has been proposed that this is also important. And even in a class of uh, Parkinson uh, uh, disease. Now, um, uh, as I said earlier, the venous system has largely been uh, ignored. And uh, from, uh, from the point of view of our research, uh, for the last 10 years, uh, uh, this system has uh, kept us occupied. Uh, concerning fluid system, there is a lot of research in, uh, going on right now around the world. And I put here four topics of, uh, with major teams of people working in, in these areas. And I will not go much into details of this, but I, I just point out that the last one here, again, the venous system is, uh, is being allocated an important role in the lymphatic system and the clearance function of the brain. Now, the main part of my presentation is about modeling, uh, theoretically, uh, some of these processes uh, through mathematical modeling of a fluid dynamics. Uh, we take a, a global approach in the sense that we would like to see the interaction of the fluid compartments, even if we sacrifice the detail of particular districts, the interaction being an important uh, issue here. So we began 10 years ago working on this and we published our first paper on, on our first model, a global model in 2014. And recently we have submitted and has been approved, uh, accepted with minor corrections, a Mark II version of the model here uh, uh, with a, a lot of extensions and improvements here. So what you see is the, is the arterial system of the full body, the venous system of the full body, and here uh, we have the pulmonary circulation. So we have the two circulations, uh, systemic and pulmonary, a uh, model for the heart and, and some other parts of the human body or, or the circulation so that the whole thing functions as a, 
uh, as a close approximation to the real thing. For the head, in addition to the uh, vasculature, of course, the venous and, and arterial and the microvasculature, we also have special models for the cerebral spinal fluid here uh, for the uh, cranial uh, SAS here, for the ventricles here. Uh, in particular, we have a uh, one compartment for the aqueducts of Silvius here, uh, mainly because uh, um, there is a lot of data, measured uh, magnetic resonance data here that can be utilized to validate some of our computations here. And of course, we have uh, the model for the spinal cord. Now, my model at the moment for the spinal cord is indeed very simple. It's a, it's a, a zero dimensional model, as it's called, uh, in the sense that the, the variations of quantities within the spinal canal here uh, are uh, only time dependent. They are uniform in space. So that is a, is a major limitation of the model at the moment. But I will mention a few uh, attempts to extend this uh, later on at the end of my presentation. So uh, briefly, uh, that, that, that is a brief description of the model. Uh, uh, this is the only, I think, the only mathematical page here uh, that I will not uh, explain in full detail here. But part of the differential equations that for part of the mathematical model include a, a conservation of mass and momentum. So it, it, these are statements of physical uh, laws of uh, fluid dynamics in, in biological uh, uh, conduits. So I'm going to just stay with equation one here to uh, um, uh, stay a little bit with the, 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 the quantity A here. The quantity A is the cross-sectional area of a blood vessel. Okay, and it will depend on distance along the vessel x and time, because these vessels are compliant vessels; they are not rigid vessels. So here we are accounting in a simple way, uh, uh, though, for a fluid structure interaction, the interaction of the vessel with the fluid inside. Uh, there are more quantities of interest here, in particular the pressure. The pressure is a precious quantity in, in biology, biological fluid, and, and one which is very difficult to quantify in reality because uh, uh, measurements are usually invasive and, and, and you only get pa uh, uh, partial information on this very important point. In the mathematical model, this quantity is computed in, in, the, full, in the full body. Uh, just to say that we don't use commercial packages here. We develop our own advanced numerical algorithms to solve these equations from a computer and get numerical solutions. So then you are in a position to compute quantities of interest, flow, velocity, cross-section at area, and pressure anywhere in the human body uh, that is represented by the network of vessels that we have in the mathematical model. Now, this is a sample computation here uh, to show the capability fundamentally of the model. And, and so this is a full body sample computation, but I am displaying here only what is of interest perhaps to you here. So what we have by version of the Monroe Kelly doctrine, we have a rigid uh, casing here for the cranial uh, cavity. And so there is competition within the cardiac cycle. There is competition of volumes here. So we have, uh, in systole here, we have an increase in this red volume here. You can see here this rectangular area is representing that. Uh, you have an increase of that in the cardiac cycle, but since this is rigid, fluids are incompressible then that uh, uh, increase will have to imply necessarily the displacement of other fluids from the cranial cavity. And so that will happen to the uh, venous part that will go down to the jugular veins and to the heart and to the cerebrospinal fluid that will go into the spinal canal. 
Uh, so this is a computation. This is not a, a, a cartoon downloaded from, from the web, apart from the heart here, which is just to illustrate that uh, the thing is happening in real time. And so the interaction here in the, uh, between the serial blood, the venous blood, the brain parenchyma, the CSF in the cranium, and the CSF in the spinal cord. Uh, now, are these computations uh, of any meaning whatsoever? Or, or, or do they mean anything? Do they represent reality? Because the mathematical model is a very abstract construction consisting of differential equations solved on a computer. Uh, and, uh, and then you uh, put in the virtual information of a, a human being there. So, other results meaningful. Do they tell us anything? So, <clears throat> this is something that we, we have to check routinely, as it happens in other fields of science. You have to compare predictions, say, in aerospace or, or, or physics. You have to compare your predictions with measurements. Measurements are the thing. Although measurements are also uh, difficult and subject to errors, naturally. So here, what we are doing is to compare, if we are comparing here in the aqueducts of Silvius, the CSF flow here, U, and we are comparing this here, this is uh, the prediction is the, is, the, is the black line here. This is the cardiac cycle here, time, and we compare with measured data obtained from this uh, very large team of researchers here. Uh, uh, then we look at velocities and we see that the agreement uh, and mass and lead is surprisingly good. Uh, there, there will never be a 100% agreement. There cannot be a 100% agreement for a good number of reasons. Uh, now we have a more uh, a comparison here. Uh, what you see here in this picture on the left is arterial flow into the brain here, it normalized, so it is a maximum of one here. This is the red, this is the, this is the black curve here with a point. This is data obtained from this paper here, Professor Alfred. And the simulations are uh, represented by the red line here. Uh, and this is a, uh, 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 now, where is it perform? Uh, perform at the at the uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I, I'm confusing it here. Now, then we go to the CSF flow as C250 level, corresponding to this simulation. So, in the same computation in the same uh, subject, uh, where the simulation is done, and we have here a comparison again between simulation and measurements, and the data for that it, it comes, as I said earlier, from this publication. So this is only one of ex two examples of comparing or comparison between simulations and measurements. We've done hundreds of these comparisons, and uh, you should never stop doing this because this is an important exercise in, in the modeling uh, in the modeling world. Uh, I have just shown you two of such things. Now, uh, having a degree of confidence uh, that the mathematical model does represent reality to some approximation, we are going to use the mathematical model to study uh, the hemodynamics of bilateral transfer sinus stenosis here. So uh, we are going to uh, assume stenosis in both transfer sinuses here, and we are going to see what the consequences are for the fluid dynamics of the entire cranial spinal cavity. Uh, the full body, as a matter of fact, but of course, the consequences will be seen fundamentally in the cranial spinal part. Now, what you see here are uh, various uh, uh, vessels, for example, you have the transfer sinus, and here you have the superior sagittal sinus here, you, you have the inferior, the inferior petrosal sinus, uh, and so on. Various vessels uh, here along this axis, and then you see 
uh, on the vertical axis is the pressure, but the, the, the computed average pressure within the cardiac cycle. Okay. So what we see is the healthy control here uh, in black, uh, and these are low pressures here. And then you see a, a situation in which the subject has fully active collaterals. Because when you have strictures in the venous system, uh, the system will find ways around the strictures in order to flow, you know, to transport blood back to the heart, of course. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so when you have fully activated collaterals, you have the red bars here, which means that the pressure is still increased, even though, even though you have fully activated collaterals. So when one says that uh, it doesn't matter if you have a, a stricture in, in the venous, uh, in the venous flow, because you will have collaterals. Yes, you will have collaterals, but you will still have increases of pressure, which are perhaps modest in some cases here, but not so modest in other cases, like for example here. But if your collaterals are not very active, and that can be, and you have the full range from fully active collaterals to no activation of collaterals, then in the extreme case of no collaterals, you have huge increases in pressure in most compartments. And these values here of 30, which are rather elevated uh, values here, uh, three to four times the, the normal value of five times perhaps, uh, have been measured and uh, published in the literature. Uh, uh, not the ones corresponding to this particular subject here, but the range of values I'm saying are, uh, are reported. Now, let's see more in detail what happens uh, in the brain. Uh, this is uh, the CSF in the brain. And so we have here, this is the cardiac cycle here. So this is time dependent information within the cardiac cycle, not average values within the cardiac cycle. So this is the curve for the uh, um, um, healthy control here, the black here. This is the level. And we have an average of 1040 nine for that uh, case here. But then when we have then strictures, then we have an average of 14.23, and you can see the time dependent curve here. Uh, this is with fully active collaterals. With no active collaterals, you have 34.5, and you have a curve like this. What, ha what happens in the lateral ventricle, see, according to our computations, you have a, a, an analogous behavior here, and then you go to the third ventricle, the aqueduct of Silvius, fourth ventricle, the a cranial uh, uh, sas here, and the spinal sas here. You also have uh, uh, the computation here. The variation across here are rather small. For example, you look at the healthy control, you have here 10, 10, 10, 10. And you have only a fraction of changes here in terms of the average. But the shape might change a little bit here. For example, you can see that the shape here in the CSF in the brain parenchyma here looks different to the shape of the, of the spinal canal here. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, our, our model for the spinal canal is still rather, rather poor, I would say. So you, you can actually uh, um, talk a little bit more about these issues here, but it, it certainly gives you an idea of what is going on here. We have done other studies, of course, uh, and uh, I'm not going to mention this, there is no time for that. Uh, but consistently, we find the, a number of issues, which I'm going to mention in a minute here, and, and, and this is a summary here. The summary of our findings using the mathematical model and checking results with the measured data is that the following, that if you have cerebral venous outflow strictures, either intracranial or extracranial, then you will have increased cerebral venous pressure. Now, 
a fluid dynamics will, will tell you in advance that this is going to be the case. Okay, so that, that's fine. The question is that you have to tell me how much. And so this has to be quantified. Uh, in our case, we do this by computation, and these are the results. So the, the hypothesis that you may formulate about increased area of venous pressure is in a sense proved by these computations. Uh, now, uh, having an anomalous uh, pressure distributions, you are going to disturb the whole intracranial dynamics. You will have disturbed CSF reabsorption, of course, and you will have increased CSF volume, and you have a chain of uh, events that may depart from each of these points here. You will have increased intracranial pressure, obviously, as demonstrated uh, in previous transparencies, and you will have disturbed cerebral venous return to heart, and if you are concerned about the, cle the clearance function of the venous system, well, you are disturbing that too. Uh, now, uh, uh, I'm coming to, towards the end of this presentation, and uh, I will mention here ongoing work on a more refined model for the cerebral spinal fluid in the spinal canal. So we have some preliminary results here. Uh, there are two areas of our interest here is ocular dynamics on the one hand. You can see here uh, below the optic nerve here, you have cerebral spinal fluid here. Uh, this is a pathological case here, a very high volume of cerebral spinal fluid compressing the optic nerve. Compression of the optic nerve means compression of the vasculature inside here. That compression may not affect the arterial side here, but it may affect perhaps in a profound manner the venous system here because the venous uh, drainage here uh, in this is important for the number of functions that the venous system plays, but uh, uh, the venous system is very deformed and so very uh, sensitive to compression. So, so this is an important area of research. And obviously, this is something that interests uh, this community here, uh, the spinal cord. Uh, uh, we have uh, built upon a model produced by Sirovich in 2009 that allows for a, a deformable dura here, a deformable spinal cord here, and CSF in between here. This is a coaxial model of four partial differential equations, and here you measure the cross-sectional area of the dura, and the velocity of the dura, and the flow of CSF in the dura, and the same in the spinal cord here, which assume to be a deformable medium here. We have done some analysis on this set of differential equations in, in recent years, and we are getting ready to do some computations, but we are not quite there yet. These are the equations in full. I will not uh, spend time talking about them. These are some very recent, not published, really very preliminary computations here that shows the wave character uh, of, the, of the CSF in the spinal canal as a function of time here at various positions here. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you whether this computations are correct or not. On the other hand, they are not very physiological because they are done in isolation for testing this particular model for this particular district here. Although the boundary conditions we are providing come from our global circulation model. So we, 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 we provide values at the interface between the spinal canal and the cranial cavity here. But uh, I will not claim to uh, be uh, uh, representing here uh, uh, biophysics. So we, we need to do a, a lot of more work in order to be able to uh, show results that are really uh, of value to this community here. I will make a, a general remark, uh, is that mathematical modeling offers a quantitative framework for a holistic, and I put the emphasis here on holistic, approach that includes the dynamical interaction of the major fluid components, because I think this interaction 
is an important aspect of uh, any study that is concerned with the fluid dynamics of uh, in bodily fluids. But uh, much, uh, much remains to be, to be done in this direction. Challenges ahead and ambitious thinking here, we really want to refine the definition of the, of the vasculature, at least of the brain. And uh, we are uh, in contact with the people who can provide data for this here. Uh, the lymphatic system, a major challenge, just in itself, the lymphatic system is a major challenge. Uh, we have done very preliminary work here, uh, but we are really far from uh, anything like producing a network for the for the for, for this green man here. Uh, bear in mind that the lymphatic system is connected very strongly to other systems, in particular the venous system. Uh, so with that, I thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Poro. Does anyone have any questions for this presentation? If not, um, we can maybe get in maybe a two minute break um, and then Dr. Henderson and Dr. Schubert are going to speak. Maybe just a comment. <clears throat> can you hear me? This is John Oro. Yes. Yeah. Just a comment, Dr. Toro. That that was excellent. Uh, you've um, you're showing us uh, an opening to a, a new way of studying, getting deeper in multiple uh, levels that I think will bring uh, a success for patients as as we move along. So again, congratulations. That was uh, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I can add one quick uh, comment and question. First of all, that was stunning work and very fascinating. I agree to believe it's a beautiful presentation. Uh, you, you showed volume changes, for example, between the CSF and the, and the, and the ventricular system and the spinal canal and so forth. Uh, are you able to, to expand your model to look at shifts between uh, CSF and interstitial uh, fluid spaces uh, and just to look at really flow into and out of the parenchyma of the interstitial space into the CSF spaces? It not right now, not right now. We, we do not have a model for uh, ISF at the moment. And it is a limitation of, of the model indeed, a very important limitation as a matter of fact. Yeah. And then there was one question um, about how you calculated the volume of CSF. Calculated? Uh, what was the method for calculation, calculating the volume of CSF? Ah, the volume is calculated from the fluid dynamics of the model for the full vasculature. So there is there is a model for the heart, of course. The heart is pumping, uh, fluid is flowing through the arterial system and the venous system, and you have all that information. You have it anywhere in the system. You have it. You have pressures. Uh, you have uh, uh, you have velocities. You have flow and you can calculate volumes. Now, the volumes that I show you in that uh, animation were total volumes. So for the arterial volume, we added up all the arterial vasculature. For the uh, uh, venous part, we added all the venous part and so on. So the model actually gives you all the information concerning volumes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Toro.